It's been a crazy week in the Pac-12. It has been a phenomenal week for me, uh, personally. I mean, uh, pretty excited to see the Oregon win. It was just heartwarming. I mean, it was the biggest win for the Pac-12 in a long, long time. And it was just good stuff all around. On top of that, Clay Helton got fired, baby. Um, I was a huge Clay Helton defender, supporter. But this is probably the right move for the conference, even though my coach of the year may have been eliminated <laughs> like week two. And I'm going to introduce a new segment today. We spent a lot of time talking about small or uh, big market teams. So I'm going to introduce a new segment today called Pac-12 Whip Round. I'm going to talk about every game in conference. Now that the season's really getting kind of deeper underway here, I really want to give every team at least a little love on the show. Even though y'all might not make me more money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But seriously, uh, we'll cover every team in at least a little touch, a little smidge here or there. So, wow, just saw my head was getting cut off there, whatever. Uh, so, we have a lot on the agenda today, so let's get to it. And I'm going to start with Clay Helton. I think I actually got my notes ready this week. Look at this, look at this. What do we got here? So, yeah, um, essentially, I mean, it, it's what I said at the top here. I mean, USC fans have been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. Nothing else to it. A lot of them have completely, <laughs> completely just hated him for quite a while. Like I said, me personally, I've actually thought of him as a reasonably good coach. When you go through his resume, I broke down, you know, I have all his stats throughout his whole career. A lot of up and downs, but... The two big notable things I do want to recap is he did have a little bit of success at the beginning of his career there. And let me pull up the exact year. So, yeah, in 2016, I'm still right-clicking though, guys. <laughs> what? <laughs> what the freaking right-clicking? So, um, in 2016 and 17, those are going to be the pinnacles of the Helton era with his 17-18 squad finishing... 10 and 3 with the Rose Bowl victory. So, I mean, that was a pretty solid year. And in 2018 19, they also found success, ending the year with 11 and 3 mark before ultimately losing in the Holiday Bowl. However, after that, they essentially sucked. They went 5 and 7, 8 and 5. And what I want to talk about last year is even though I did defend him, what's fair is fair. And the loss to Stanford kind of just solidified a lot of things. That 5 and 1 record last year in the COVID year was really ugly. They should have lost to ASU if it wasn't for an onside kick. They almost lost to Arizona the following week. They, I mean, they probably should have beaten Oregon in the conference championship game. Oregon probably in some sort of metaphysical way felt weird being there knowing that they, I'm not going to say they didn't deserve it. It was just the odd circumstances all around. I guess we're going metaphysical today. But in all seriousness, USC underperformed last year and it was the ugliest 5-1 and one, and they probably shouldn't have been 5-1. and one. So, Again, the Stanford loss solidifies a lot of things, and it makes sense why Clay Helton's get out of town. I was fully wrong, <laughs> said my coach of the year, gone in two weeks. But yeah, I mean, it's the best move for the Pac-12. And I think ultimately that's what I had in my notes. I want to make sure I'm not leaving anything out. But essentially, yeah, I think the timing couldn't have been much better considering the fact that UCLA seems to be finding their rhythm. ASU, even though they do have the scandal problems, or not problems, but things are probably going to happen here in the future after the season, maybe two years if we're really getting fancy with it. But we got ASU, we got UCLA, we got Oregon. Some big market teams are starting to play really well. Uh, Oregon may not necessarily be huge market, but they're not far off. Nike holds a little bit of weight, so Oregon is a substantial name. Again, they're not going to hold the weight with the LA schools, so this is why it's a big, big move if both LA schools can really get themselves rolling with UCLA. Again, Arizona State's in that Phoenix market, so that's a big team to get good. The Huskies absolutely suck, so that's going to be the other market that teams really want to get going uh, up here in Seattle. That'd be the final piece if you're looking for maximum revenue for the Pac-12 and Clay Helton now being out of town. <laughs> Man, I was wrong. I was so wrong. But Clay Helton being out of town, uh, yeah, it, it's a really good move. And I bet George Klyavkov, however you say his name, I think I got it right, will be very happy about this. Probably can't publicly say that, but this is going to be a very, very, probably good, huge, monu monumental move for the Pac-12, and it's at a perfect timing. 
And I couldn't have been more wrong, but I couldn't have been more right than to be wrong or something. That's why I hate cliches. I'm freaking it up. Freaking it up. How long we talk about him? We got a lot to cover today, guys. I'm not trying to waste your time at all. All right, five minutes. That's perfect. So, yeah. Clay Helton, he's gone. I'm wrong. Pac-12, we're about to get it, baby. All right. So, one thing. Oh, one thing I really do want to touch on here is I don't want to blow over that Oregon game. Sorry, I was like a camera second. I'm getting up to my Oregon notes here. And I don't want to blow over this Oregon game like it was nothing. It was huge. It was the biggest thing the pac twelves had in a long time. That UCLA win was huge over LSU, but it was cute in comparison. A little like tiddly, tiddly bear cute. What, what do we call those as kids? Um, Yo, what were those called? Uh, Beanie Babies? Tycoons? Or something? I just I said Tycoon. All right. Okay, no idea what Tycoon means, but back to the point here, Nick. So, the win by Oregon was just huge. I was yelling, I was screaming, and it was exactly what I needed because I had some pretty serious family stuff going on last week. So, it was the perfect way to just boost my mood. I picked Ohio State, but go Ducks, man. Whew, man, that was big. And I did write a full article. I have a on essentially three big takeaways from Ohio from uh, Oregon's victory over Ohio State. That's for another publication. If you follow me on Twitter, you can look that publication up. It's probably going to be posted tomorrow along with this show. Uh, not a part, of, not a part of Sports Pack Twelve. But if you really want my in-depth takeaway from the Ducks and their victory against Ohio State, you can look up my other publication on Twitter and yeah, do your thing over there. But in regards to today, I still want to talk about a little briefly touch up on some things here in regards to the victory and three big takeaways that really the Ducks can have going forward. I mean, this is huge. Like the Ducks are for real now. They beat Columbus or excuse me, they beat the Buckeyes in the shoe. Like that's so real. I was getting chills before the game. Did you hear the fans like, oh, hi, oh, oh. I was like, dude, this is different. This I don't hear this in the Pac-12 very often. Maybe Oregon fans can actually hold their weight with that, but not many other programs can. Maybe Utah uh, on a smaller uh, stadium size. That's not a, that's just logistics, you know. But it was crazy. The Buckeyes are everything. That's a Alabama type team, and Oregon handled them. I mean, they played them toe to toe, outplayed them from start to finish, and it was just so big. And good for Mario Cristobal, good for everyone. And they did it without Kayvon Thibodeau. I mean, that just, that's a sign of, wow, if this team doesn't have a slip up, how for real are they? Like, I, you cannot overlook this win. And let me get to a quick little synopsis of my three takeaways, because I do want to get to that whip round segment today. But, yeah, man, that was, yeah, that was, that was big. That was big, big time stuff. So, Three big takeaways here. My first biggest takeaway is going to be Oregon's offensive line. Biggest surprise of the game was really the way the Ducks controlled the line of scrimmage. Got a couple of stats for you here if you guys are stats nerds. UO doubled Ohio State's production on the ground. The Ducks rushed for 269 yards, while the Buckeyes only tallied 128. CJ Verdell led Oregon on the ground 20 carries, 161 yards, and two touchdowns. And quarterback Anthony Brown chipped in 65 yards and 10 carries. Well, halfback Travis Dye rounded out the trio with eight carries, 43 yards, and what and one touchdown. So again, a really balanced, dominant attack, and being able to mix it up like that is crucial when you're playing elite competition like the Buckeyes. And Ohio State learned their lesson, you know. So getting a lot of different people involved in the running game, and that was cool to see. On top of that, essentially, if you. Yeah, I think that's all I want to say in regards to the offensive line. I think it was just cool to see these guys were essentially the youngest unit in the year, or one of the youngest units. Let me pull up that stat. Stat nerd, stat nerd. Um, yeah, so before the or prior to the 2021 season kicking off, the Ducks return all five starting offensive linemen. And the prior COVID season, oh yes, they did indeed have the youngest group in the nation like literally the youngest group in the nation so i mean the year is paying dividends apparently again to be able to hold your own against uh, the buckeyes the second takeaway i had was the defensive line again i don't need to go too deep here throw out a couple stats to give you a perspective on the game and why it's so impressive but 
Well, Oregon didn't completely stymie the Buckeyes rushing attack. They, they definitely held their own. And it did feel that they were getting the better of OSU up front. At least, definitely in the first half. That's how it felt to me, at least. And Buckeyes halfback, Mayan Williams, rushed for 77 carries on 14 yards. So, I mean, that's not a bad day. I mean, it's pretty decent average. But in the opener, he rushed for 125 yards on nine touches. That's uh, Zach Charbonnet numbers down there at UCLA. So, I mean, in the opener, he ran for over 10 yards of carry. And against Oregon, it was knocked down to 5.5. And that just gives you a chance to compete. In the NFL, you'd like that number to be smaller. But in college football, that gives you a chance to compete if you can keep it less than like six yards. That's big stuff. I mean, against elite competition, that is. You're, you're just not getting gashed every play. And Oregon did more than that on the defensive line. And that was huge. And all of this without Kayvon Thibodeau, again, I mean, that's just huge. I mean, once he comes back, how good can this team be? And when a player sees his brothers perform like that, now he's coming back fired up. I mean, he obviously he's like a millionaire already, but now he's got real reason. He sees this team is national championship caliber. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to happen for sure. Again, you beat Ohio State, though. You're changing minds in the shoe. And that was without your best player? Anthony Brown's still pretty new to the system? Hey, man, I was clearly wrong about the Ducks. It seems like I may be wrong about a lot of things as of right. That's so late. Don't look at my picks either this year, guys. But in all seriousness, uh, this, this win cannot be overstated. I've overstated it now enough. So... First two takeaways going to be offensive line and defensive line uh, really held their own against the Buckeyes. And the last takeaway, going to make it real quick, it could be C.J. Verdell, it could be Anthony Brown, but it's going to be Verone McKinley the third. He had those two massive hits in the first half that really kind of just set the tone. I mean, maybe not massive hits, but broke up pass plays and forced incompletions with some big hits. And it just kind of set the tempo. It felt like it calmed everyone else's nerves. And it felt like it just gave the team that, like, the belief that, oh, we're here to play. Like, we can compete against Ohio State. This is a matchup where we have a chance. We're here to perform. We got, a, like, we got a chance. And it felt like he was the guy who let him know that talent-wise, oh, I'm here to play, boys. And the rest of the team seemed to follow suit. And I believe his total stats, and they were really impressive. Obviously, he had the game-winning interception, which was, uh, it was just right. It felt right that the ball fell in his hands on that overthrow from C.J. Stroud. Still C.J. Stroud, baby. And now I can say it. Even more small because the Ducks B-Day. Day, they B -day? That help us at B-Day because now that could be inappropriate. But no, seriously, I mean, uh, C.J. Stroud, man, overthrew that ball. And it was just right that it fell into McKinley Wright's hands uh, after all he'd done throughout the game. So his final stats on the day were six tackles, one forced fumble. Forgot about that. That's impressive. The two aforementioned pass deflections and... The aforementioned interception. Game winning interception. Let's make that clear. He still caught the ball, and some players may have dropped it, so he took advantage of his opportunity. Mikhail Wright is a baller. And uh I think something that is kind of cool that I feel a little bit passionate about, and we'll get to the whip round after this, is I think that safety is often an overlooked position, uh all the time in football, to be quite frank. I just think that people don't realize how important it is. It may be considered like the quarterback of the defense. And last year, the Ducks lost Javon Holland and Brady Breeze. And it's not a shock that they allowed 28.3 points per game last year. Both those guys were NFL safeties. And the safeties can limit big plays on the or limit big plays through the air. They can contain the run game. They really do everything. They're your last line of defense. So when those two are in check, a 7-yard pass may go to a 17-yard pass, but not a 70-yard one to the house. You're making teams beat you consistently. So again, the reason that maybe the Ducks defense struggled so much last year is they lost two NFL safeties. I don't know if Mikhail Wright's going to be as good as Javon Holland. I think he's probably going to be just as good, if not better, than Brady Breeze. Javon Holland was a <laughs> immense talent. But again, Mikhail Wright is a phenomenal player in his own right. And he probably is an NFL career in his future. So just want to end with that. And now that they got the safety position figured out, the Ducks, again, could really, really go far. And, oh, yeah, did I mention they're getting Thibodeau back? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, that's going to do it for that. Just don't don't overlook this game. Fans in Eugene, before you play frickin' Stony Brook, take one more beer. I don't know what your local brewery is. Is, is it Deschutes? I don't know. In Seattle, I think we got Red Hook up here. But Deschutes, go enjoy one more beer. And seriously, I mean, that was just a win. That Man, like, I'm a packed guy. That, that was what's up.
So let's not overlook that and truly enjoy it. All right, cool timing. So we're here for the Pac-12 Whip Round. And uh, by the way, if you are new to the show, I will always get you out of here in 25 minutes or less, unless it's like a championship week or we have a crazy special guest, maybe Sasquatch, maybe Jimi Hendrix, who knows. But I like don't listen to Jimi Hendrix at all. It just felt right to say there. But the Pac-12 Whip Round segment is going to be, again, I'm going to break down your favorite team in minimum two to three sentences. Maybe I'll talk a little bit longer, and I want to get every game covered, so I'm going to get right to it. If that wasn't clear enough, I'm going to break down every th- every game in two to three sentences. Maybe more if I recall it, get on a roll. So, first game, guys. What do we got here? Utah at San Diego State. The loss to rival BYU is probably enough of a wake-up call for Utes not let this happen again. A couple players to watch going to be a freshman running back, Micah Bernard. Um, Charlie Brewer, quarterback, new quarterback. We want to see if he can have a bounce-back game after the tough loss. And, obviously, as always, star linebacker Devin Lloyd. And those are going to be the three names really to watch. And I'm thinking Utah wins by like 10 to 21 points. Bottom line, this could be a trap game. But a Kyle Whittingham coach team is not going to blow two games in a row. And if they do, then this team is probably in for a very, very rough year. But I find it highly unlikely. Utah wins by 10 to 21 points. Expect a nice bounce back performance. Next game we got. Oh, this is pretty fun. Speaking of ASU, or speaking of BYU, they're playing ASU. Wow, that the U's are throwing me off there. So ASU is at Provo and I mean, this is essentially the same thing. I don't even need to see my notes. BYU with the win against Utah is not going to sneak up on ASU. If they hadn't won that game, I think they would have stood a chance. ASU is talented, talented, extremely talented. And BYU did lose, I believe, the most returning production in the nation. And, yeah, they're just not going to be able to do it. They may have been able to pull it off in a rival. Motion's running high. Lost nine times in a row or something like that. But against ASU... ASU now sees a ranked opponent and on the road. They're not coming in lightly. I believe the ASU wins by 10 or 14 points. Is that what I wrote? No, I said they went in a comfortable blowout fashion. Nah, that's like 10 to 14 points. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, next game. Fresno State at UCLA. Guess what? Guess what? Maybe that's why these are all grouped together. Fresno State is not going to sneak up on anybody anymore. Uh... Next, have quarterback, what's his name? Hayner down there, Jake Hayner making big moves. And they're a pretty solid team. I believe they got, I, yeah, I don't know that much about Fresno State. I interviewed a guy once. I'm going to talk about the Bruins. Essentially, the way the Bruins dominated LSU, I don't think that Fresno State is going to be able to hang with them. And Fresno State played, who'd they play tough? They played Oregon really tough in the first week. And I believe they blew out their next two opponents. And so, yeah, I mean, you got anything else there? Oh, one last thing. Uh, for me, main point of interest is to see if DTR can find some consistency before Pac-12 play really gets r- rolling. It's kind of had some big plays, hit or miss there. Still not the biggest DTR guy, but I do respect what he's done. I still want to see more consistency, but I do believe UCLA, w- UCLA wins by like 7 to 10 points. Hey, that was actually what I wrote down. Next game, um, Sanford at Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt sucks. They lost to East Tennessee State 23-3 in the opener, and I believe is at home as well. Stanford should not lose to a team that is getting blown out by D2 schools. One thing that is interesting to see if Stanford can carry this momentum forward, uh, carry the momentum forward from the huge, huge win against USC. I mean, shocked me. Clearly, Mr. Pick and Clay Helton for Coach of the Year. But yeah, uh, should be interesting to see if Stanford can carry this momentum forward. And yeah. That's a uh, do you got anything else on these guys? Oh, um, a couple things I actually did want to add is how will Tanner McKee perform um, against the Trojans? He completed 13 of 16 passes for 234 yards and two touchdowns. And so, yeah, I want to see if he can keep this momentum, keep his rhythm, and they, this would be a nice opportunity against a. I mean, they're from a major conference, but Vanderbilt's been up, struggling pretty bad the last couple of years. They beat Colorado State by like three points last week, but again, you lost to like East Tennessee State by 20, man. Stanford should handle them easily. Next game is going to be Minnesota-Colorado, and this game could actually prove the funnest watch of the week. Uh, both these teams have shown glimpses elite, against elite competition. You had Minnesota playing Ohio State pretty tough in the opener. Colorado lost to Texas A&M by three points last week. 
And my main point of concern or main spotlight is going to be how will freshman quarterback Brendan Lewis perform for the Buffs. I think that if he can just do things, that the Buffs will be all right. They have a lot of talent at the skill position players, which is why I'm actually going to pick CU to win the game. But there's one stat I do really want to tell you in this one. And so they've got to get more touches to those wideouts, specifically Levante Chanel, Demetri Stanley, and Brendan Rice. No receiver on their team has more than four catches this year. So that just, yeah, you got to do better than that, especially when you have weapons of that caliber and Jarek Broussard in the backfield. Colorado uses their home field altitude, and I'm thinking they win by like three to seven points. Really good game, and I think a really fun game to watch. I believe it's early. I love the early game, so I'll probably be up watching that with some green tea. All right, how long have I been talking? 20 minutes? We might just skip Barlett's random topic of the day today. That is okay. Oh, never mind. This, these are the fun notes. These are the fun notes. We're quick. We're quick now. USC at WSU. Clay Helton is gone. Nick Rolovich is there. USC wins by 7 to 10. And probably smacks the Cougs. 7 to 10 is being very generous. Maybe it is because I'm a Coug, but I'm thinking USC goes haywire on the plus. Maybe parties with the Cougars after, I don't know. They're going to kill them. I think USC is going to win pretty comfortably. I just gave you like three predictions in one. What am I going to go with here? USC wins by 10 to 14. Bottom line, they win. All right. Next game, Idaho at Oregon State. Uh, one quick note on this game is that against Hawaii, signal caller Chance Nolan, Oregon State's quarterback, completed 21 of 29 passes, two touchdowns, and zero interceptions. This game should prove another opportunity to boost the stats before Pac-12 play. Freshman wideout Anthony Gold also had a breakout performance against Hawaii with seven catches, 119 yards, and one touchdown the day. And in regards to analysis in this game, Idaho is eight miles away from Pullman. They've always been bad at football, and Oregon State should win comfortably. Next game, CSUS at Cal. Who in the heck is CSUS? I didn't even look them up. Essentially, Justin Wilcox knows he needs to win this game to save his season, and he's going to win. The next game is Arkansas State at Washington, and uh, Jimmy Lake knows that he needs to win this game to save his season, and he wins. <laughs> All right, any other games? NAU at Arizona, baby. Actually, uh, this one I do want to see if Jed Fish can get the boys rolling. This is probably their only opportunity for a win. To me, it's more interesting than Cal and Washington because those programs are kind of just meddling out right now. When it comes to Arizona, this team needs to find something. They need something to really build off the initial life that Jed Fish brought into the program. They've had some trouble with the quarterback, not really finding consistency got really their stuff handed to them last week. So Arizona, this may be their one chance to win. And I just want to see these kids show heart, really. Like, I just want to see them keep playing and show pride for their school, for themselves, for their family. Uh, that's what I want to see out of Arizona. I want to see them get a W. Am I getting emotional? Maybe. Uh, Stony Brook at, Air at Oregon. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> come on, guys. <laughs> I mean, even though, or this is like, in all senses of the world, the terms, this is a trap game. No, I mean, just or, like, no, like Oregon's going to beat Stony Brook by 400, dude. That's it. Do you have time for Barlett's Ram topic of the day? It actually fits in perfectly. We have a minute and a half for Barlett's Ram topic of the day. For Barlett's random topic of the day, I hate people. And you guys probably know exactly what we're talking about. Just so we're all on the same page. I don't hate people. That was a strong statement. That was a strong statement. Don't you guys just strongly prefer, strongly, strongly prefer when you're at the end of a work meeting and you have that one person who always keeps asking a question. My gosh, my gosh. That's it. That's it. It's, 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 why? Stop. I got to go. Stop. Can't you read the room, bro? All right. On that note, hey, I promised you we'd be out in 25 minutes, so I'm not going to be that guy. Concluding and summarizing today's episode, seriously, thank you guys for tuning in as always. It has been a blast. I've been excited to really get these shows, get them underway, and really with some football actually happening, it's pretty cool to see. I may keep you for 25, 30 today, guys. Concluding and summarizing today's episode, I started by talking about the Clay Helton firing. I was completely wrong. I picked him for my coach of the year. My goodness, was I wrong, but this is probably the best move for the conference. The timing couldn't have been better. Uh, George, Kla George Klyavkov is probably very happy about this. And with UCLA, 
ASU and Oregon doing really well. The big market teams are starting to find a rhythm. And with all the revenue streams and the college football landscape changing, this couldn't have happened at a better time. If USC gets going, good things are going to happen. Second, essentially, Oregon is balling with that victory over Ohio State. Do not forget it. Do not forget it. That is one of the biggest wins in a long, long, long time for the Pac-12. Just enjoy it. Eugene fans, Ducks fans, have one more beer. One more beer. All right. And I took a quick whip around off around the conference. And off the top of my head, I may leave some teams out. I think I picked Utah over whoever the heck they're playing. I picked ASU over BYU. I picked, okay, let me look. I'm not going to tell you, everyone, who I picked. You guys just watch. That's, that's a waste of everyone's time. All right, guys. We are out. Oh, it's almost 26 minutes. I'm shutting the show down. Thank you guys for watching, as always. Like and subscribe. Yes, sir. And my tagline is olive oil and hummus. Deuces.